According to John, chapter 20, verse 31, the Gospel of John was written so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. It's great. He gets to the end of the book and lets us know why He wrote it. And all through the book, He's presenting His case to get to that thesis statement that's at the end. And part of His presentation of these truths, John records eight miracles of Jesus. Eight specific miracles. Now true, there's a whole lot more than that. Matter of fact, John in, follows up in chapter 20 and said, well, if we broke down every single one of them and all the details of them, it would fill all the books and all the world. That's how many he did. But John wanted to highlight eight very specific miracles. And this morning we're going to look at miracle number six. First we had the changing of the water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana, if you remember that. Next he healed the long distance healing of a nobleman's son who was dying, if you remember that one. Then we had the healing of the crippled man uh, that was in the uh, pool of, uh, of, of uh, Bethsaida. Had been crippled all of his life and complained he couldn't get to the waters when they were stirred fast enough, if you remember that. It was on the Sabbath and that's what kicked off all of the um, the, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees being so upset. We had the feeding of the 5,000. Let's see, that's one, two, three, four, five. The five was walking on the water. Remember that one? That's five. So now we're at number six. We got number six. And this miracle, Jesus is giving sight to a blind man in Jerusalem. So if you have any Bibles, let's look at that. It's in chapter 9. I see the light. <laughs> Chapter 9, beginning in the very first verse, if you'll join with me. And as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned, nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me. As long as it is day, night is coming when no man can work. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. And when he had said this, he spat upon the ground, and he took the clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. And so he went away and washed, and he came back seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and those who previously saw him as a beggar, were saying, Is this not the one who used to sit and beg? And others were saying, This is he. Still others were saying, No, no, he's, he, but he's like him. But he kept saying, no, I am the one. Therefore they were saying to him, How, how then were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man who was called Jesus made clay. He anointed my eyes. He said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And so I went away and washed. And I received sight. And they said to him, well, where is he now? And he said, I don't know. In the context, as we've been reading through, remember Jesus had this long debate about the Feast of Tabernacle time with, with the Pharisees. It went all the way through chapters 6 and 7 and 8, this ongoing theological debate. And if you remember at the very end, things got so heated and contentious, they picked up stones to stone him and throw at him, but when they looked up, he wasn't there. He removed himself from their sight. He didn't go very far because we find out he's still here in Jerusalem because that's where the pool of Shalom is. So he's still there, but he's walk, probably walking out as he passes out because the beggars were always at the gates of the temple or the gates uh, of Jerusalem. But it appears that as he's walking out of the gates of the temple, there's a blind man, and he's been there all the time. If he had been blind since birth, every day they, his family or somebody would most likely lead him there, put him in his spot, and he would beg, and this is what he did every day. And so everybody kind of knew it. They used to see him. He'd been there for years. I don't know if he's 30, 40, 50 years old, but he'd been there for a long time. 
And so as they're going out, Jesus stops. His disciples are following along behind. And Jesus stops and he's looking at this guy. And then and everybody stops and the disciples are trying to figure out how come Jesus is paying so much attention to this fellow. So they're trying to figure out what's going on. Is a lot of silence. And so to break the silence, um, they try a little small talk. Say, Jesus, why do you think this man had been born blind? And they had two possibilities. One was that he had committed some sin while he was in the mother's womb. The Pharisees taught that that was possible, by the way. He was born about blind because he had sinned inside of the womb. Or the other option was that his folks, one or both of them, had done something so bad, so evil, so simple, that God punished them by making their son blind when he was born. Those were the two options. Which one was it, Jesus? Jesus said neither. And he gave them a third option, which they had not even considered at all. What was the third option? Jesus said that this man had been born blind so that at that day, at that time, at that location, the works of God might be displayed. Displayed means manifested, put, put out for everyone to see, made widely known. Jesus said that's the reason why he was born blind. <clears throat> he had born, been born blind so that in the perfect timing of God his creator, he would be given his sight supernaturally through Jesus and this would be done for the glory of God Almighty. Now we know it was done for God's glory. Jesus, in a couple verses before that, towards the end of the 8th chapter, Jesus said, uh, I don't do these things for my glory. If I glorify myself, He said, my glory is nothing. You see, everything Jesus did was for the Father's glory. It was all about glorifying God. Every single thing Jesus did in His life was for that purpose, to glorify God. Now, as I was reading through this passage, I said, ooh, I could look at, ooh, I could do, ooh, I could go. There were so many things to unpack, but I decided to narrow it down and focus on verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4. For those of you who were dozing when I read it earlier, here it is again. <laughs> Jesus said, It was neither that this man sinned, nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me. As long as this day, because night is coming when no man can work. Jesus said, well, I just did the works of God by ministering to this blind man according to the will of God. Remember, Jesus didn't do any miracles. He didn't do anything without God leading him and instructing him to do it. And then when God would tell him to do it, God would give him the power to do those things. When Jesus became a man, he laid aside his prerogatives. Not that he wasn't still God, but that he would not operate a work outside of what the Father was telling him to do. He submitted himself to the authority of God Almighty. And so he said, I did the work of God because God was leading him to do that. And I'm doing this according to the will of God. And I'm doing the work of God. And I'm doing it to bring glory to God. Then, he said, but likewise... He says that we, now who's he speaking to? The disciples. <clears throat> you do get it that you're the we now, right? We, the disciples, are also, he said, to do the works of God. So that we also will bring glory to God too. Psalm 29 1 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name. What in the world is glory? I mean, you read it a lot in the Bible. You can't read more than two or three psalms in a row when you're talking about the glory of God, glory, 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 glory. What the heck is that? Originally, it had the meaning of, of, of perfect beauty. Beauty. You just look at something and go, oh. It's like having that restored 1957 Chevy. Oh, that's a beauty of a car. Okay? I want a beauty. That's perfect. Oh, my goodness. All shined up. That's the beauty of a car. But as time went on, that word started gaining a greater meaning than just 
extreme beauty. It started to have a, a, a much greater, uh, more impactful meaning, uh, meaning, and it eventually evolved to have the meaning of to magnify something, to make something look bigger and greater and more grand and more amazing. And so this is what it's talking about when we talk about adding glory to God. Because we have to say it in that way. Because God is absolutely 110% pure, holy, perfect, and full of glory. He's not missing any. So how do we add glory to God? We can't. He's already full of glory. We can't add anything more to God than what He already has. But we glorify God when our words and our actions reflect His glory. And people are able to see His glory in the things that we say and do. When we do the works of the one who sent Jesus, we glorify God is how we make it work. Glorify God. Now, this isn't just something we do to be cool to do every now and then. And it's not something to do whenever we figure it might be convenient to do. Glorifying God is the single reason behind all of God's creation. Glorifying God. God created everything for the purpose of glorifying Himself. Psalm 19.1 The heavens are telling of the glory of God and the expanse is declaring the works of His hands. But it's not just the heavens. It's not just the earth. It's about us too. In Isaiah chapter 43 God is speaking. And He's talking about everyone who is called by my name whom, He says, I have created for my glory. He said, I created you for my glory. It's why we exist. Anybody ever heard of the Westminster Catechisms? Back in the 1600s, to make sure that everybody was going to, on the same page of knowing what they believed and what the foundational truths were uh, for the Protestant church, they came up with this catechism, and basically it was a teaching device. And it would be a question, and then an answer based on Scripture. And then another question, those are questions about God, and questions about Jesus, and questions about salvation, and questions about sin. And so you memorize, and you learn, this is how they learned it, about who God is. And then there would, the answer would be a little paragraph, four or five sentences. And then, what, where does this happen? Why is this happening? The very first question in the catechism, the very first one is, what is the chief end of man? We would say it a little differently because we ain't in the 1600s. We would say, what is the main goal or purpose of man? Very first question. Very first thing we need to know when we're going to talk about God and our beliefs and our faith. What is our purpose? What is the main purpose for man? You want to know what the answer is? Good. It is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That is why we're here. To glorify God and then enjoy it forever. God has created every single person with abilities, and in this case, disabilities, so that He will be glorified. Now some folks kind of object to this kind of line of thinking about God. Doesn't this make God, I don't know, a little self-centered? Who else is He going to be centered on? <laughs> Who else is He going to lift up? Who else is He going to magnify? Who else is He going to worship or praise? Who else is He going to submit to and obey? There is no one else. Some people might ask, well, does this mean that God is just using us? Is God just, did He create it just to use us? The answer is yes. Yes. Oh, we don't like that. We will be our own person. Remember what He said, for all who call upon my name, as far as the, the New Testaments are, we, we take Isaiah's writing and apply it to the New Testament. Those, all of those who come to Him through saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God has created 
for his glory. Because he made us into a new creation. We are all a new creation. Ephesians 2.10 says that we were created in Christ Jesus for what? Anybody remember what the purpose? For good works. Which were established beforehand. The option of living for ourselves is not an option for Christians. It is not an option given to us. Because the only reason we exist as Christians is to glorify God. That He is to be the center of our life. We like to be the center and let everything work around us. Right? Just driving to church. I'm just everybody get out of my way. Don't drive too slow. Man, I'm the center of the universe. Oh, I got God in there circling around me. Okay, and I like to keep it kind of close. But see, that's not how it is. We glorify God because He's the biggest thing. He's the most impressive thing. He's the central thing. It's our job to try to work our way and navigate around Him and get as close as we can. But he is the center. It is not an option not to glorify God. And one very important reason for that is in Romans 1, the very definition of unbelief is failure to glorify God. If you don't glorify God, you are guilty of unbelief. I didn't say it. Read Romans 1. It says that's why the wrath of God is coming upon them for they, because they failed to believe in God. As Christians, we are the body of Christ that is on this earth now. At one point in time, Jesus walked this earth. He is not walking on this earth anymore. He left behind, He went to be with the Father. He left behind us as His body. We are supposed to be continuing in the ministry that He started. We are doing the ministry of Jesus Christ every day. And in the same way that everything that He did focused on glorifying the Father, that needs to be our focus too. It's why we were created. To glorify Him by doing His works. So a couple things let me just say about the works. Because a lot of folks, well, I, don't really, I, don't, I don't know what the works of God are. I'll just give you three. I'll give you the big three. Here's the work of faith. That's by us trusting every day and placing our unfailing faith in Him. Trusting Him with the past and the present and the future and circumstances. That's the work of faith. And when we can do that, that glorifies God. And we don't trust on anything else. The other is the work of worship. The work of worship. That is what we offer our worship to God. Faith was in God. Worship is to God. By assigning Him and magnifying Him and lifting Him as the most important thing that exists in our lives, that's worship. And thanking Him and praising Him for who He is. The work of faith, the work of worship, and then there's the work of service. That's submitting and service for God. Faith in God. Worship to God. Service for God. Well, how am I supposed to know what God wants me to do? You know, home we got those little lists. Men, you know the little list your wife puts on the refrigerator? <coughs> we all got a little list. We know what the list is. How am I supposed to know what the works of God are? How am I supposed to know what I'm supposed to do and when I'm supposed to do it? Let me ask you. How much time do you spend every day asking Him what He wants you to do? How much time do we really truly spend asking Him? Or we might think of stuff we want to do and then hope He goes along with it. How much time do we spend asking? You know, one of the reasons why we don't ask Him because we're afraid He'll tell us. <laughs> I tell the story when, I, when first the gospel, um, the Lord started applying that the truth to my heart, and I go, oh, no, I, I don't know. One of the first things I thought of was, oh my goodness, if I have to give myself 100% to God, He might send me to Africa. I don't want to go to Africa. That might be the word that He 
he tells me to do. And if I have to do what he tells me to do, i got to think about this. Luckily, the Lord kind of grabbed me like this and did one of those. Woke me up, shook me really good, and I said, yes, Lord. And I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. I used to go up and do some volunteer work after that at the International uh, Mission Board up there in Rockville. Nothing fancy, no teaching, no preaching. I helped with the grounds crew. I'd go up there one day a week and work the weed eater. The lawnmowers. Just for Jesus. After being there about a year, the guy that was kind of the head of the maintenance department, he comes pulling up in his little gator up next to me. I'm, I'm out there working. He goes, Ed, come on, won't you? We're going to get the team together. We're going to, we're going to go on a mission trip. Won't you go? I said, where are you going? You want to guess where he told me? <laughs> he said, we're going to Africa. <laughs> oh, very funny, God. Very funny. <laughs> you see, we're afraid to ask God because we're afraid of what the answer might be. You know, he took me to Africa and brought me back. You know, he took me to Africa. And I had an opportunity to witness to the Maasai Nation. I had an opportunity to witness and be his tool and his workmanship in that place. And during that period of time, I saw almost a hundred people come to Christ. Wow. Other people had been there and done the planting and the watering, and God sent me to Africa to dream. You just got to ask God, because He might just want you to water. He might just want you to plant some seeds. He might just, you don't know. But He knows. And He saved you and He created you to be who you are for this very purpose. And He's got stuff for you to do. The other thing about works, it's not just the big stuff. And I mentioned, oh, I'll call you to Africa. Oh, he's going to call me to be a preacher. Oh, he's going to, you know, it's in everything, not just the big things. The works aren't the, just the big stuff, although they can be. But it's every tiny detail in your life. All the things that go on during the day, you're to do them in such a way, in such a manner, that they glorify God. Because you're doing it the right way. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Every single thing that we do. Because everything that we do is one of two things. It is either our own works or it's the works of God. There's only two, two choices. Everything we do is either our works or His. We're either living for ourselves or we're living for God. And it is impossible to glorify God by living for ourselves. It is impossible. It will not happen. You will not give glory to God. I don't care how good you think you're doing. That's why people who are not saved, they can do a lot of great works and they are not pleasing to God. They can start a hospital. They can do all kinds of things. But if they did not do those things according to the moving of the Holy Spirit, according to what God wants them to do for His glory, then they were done for that person or whatever motive they might have. No matter how good it is, it is still done for man's glory and not God's. Now, living this kind of a life, I can already hear you thinking, man, this, this, this is hard. I don't know about asking God what He wants me to do. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I'm too tired. I'm too old. I, 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 I don't know what to do. I don't know if I'll be able to do it. I don't know if I have the strength to do it. Notice what Jesus said when He gave us this instruction. He said, we. Now, I was talking to the disciples, so we know it included them. But, but you notice He said, we must do it. I did the works of God by giving this blind man His sight. But we, before it gets dark, and you know he's talking about a limited time, y'all do know y'all have a shelf life, right? We, Jesus is saying we, the body of Christ, he said we have to do the works of God while there's still time. While you are drawing a breath, that's your opportunity to do the works of God here on this earth. And the fact that he said we, he is saying, but I'm going to be there with you. I'm going to be there to help you. Inside of every believer, Jesus Christ has placed His Holy Spirit. And God has told us that what you have living inside of you, what you have 
that spirit that he placed inside of you has the power. Don't think you don't have any strength or power. You have the same power that scripture says raised Jesus from the dead. Living inside of you. Oh, glorifying God every day, all the time. That's going to be too hard. Really too hard for God? You know, there's nothing impossible for God. God is inside of you. And Jesus said, we will do it. We will do it together. <clears throat> Tell you one last thing about the works of God. And doing those works and our call to do them. I call it the glory zone. When we jump in in faith and we will find that as we work harder and harder to make sure that our motives and, and our thoughts and our words and our deeds are done with the purpose of glorifying God. When we do that, we'll find ourselves in this little glory circle. It's kind of cool. First part, when we listen to the words of our Creator and we respond, He's telling us what to do, He's instructing us, and we respond in word and deed in humble obedience, yes Lord, and we do them, this glorifies or magnifies God in our lives. And what that means is we then make God a bigger part of our lives, more important, more vital, a, a greater aspect of our being when we do that. And it glorifies God. And then God, in seeing our humble obedience and our submission to Him, He is moved to share some of His glory back to you. And me. We glorify Him. He sees that. He loves that. And He sends a little of that glory back to us. Now, how does that magnify us? Because when God does that, He reaches and touches inside of our soul. And we're reminded of what a vital uh, 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 part of His kingdom. And how that we are His children. And we've been adopted. And we are the saints and co heirs with Christ who will live forever. And we see that happening. And our importance and our value of our lives gets greater and greater when they're in God in Christ. So we magnify God. He gives us some glory back. Then He magnifies us. And then we are so moved by the truth of who we are as His children, we can't help but magnify Him back again and give Him more glory. And it goes on and on and on. And the only thing that will break the cycle is when we stop glorifying God. Miracle number six was about Jesus giving sight to a man who was created blind so that he could be restored and give glory to God the Creator. But it's also a reminder that God didn't just create us, church. He didn't just create us to go to heaven. Because if that's the purpose, we'd all be there. And I wouldn't be preaching today. He'd be listening to Jesus. But He did create us. And we are here. And He created us for His glory. And we can and we must. And we are called to. Glorify Him in everything that we do. I was hoping Arnett. She did play a. We did get to sing a hymn that had glory to the Lord in it. I was hoping maybe I should have called her. Hmm. To God be the Lord. Great things He has done. Hallelujah. Amen. Father God, help us. Lord, we thank you for the instruction of your word. Now we need your help. Lord, we need you to remind us constantly of who you are. Of how important you are. How vital you are for even every breath that we take. For every beat of our heart. You are the one responsible for any and every blessing that we have or have ever had. You are the one who is there to hear and listen to us when we are sick or hurting. You are the one who is there to comfort us when we grieve. Lord, we are reminded as we just look around and consider and stop and meditate. That you are worthy of our praise worthy of our worship. And Lord, you are due every bit of glory that we can shine forth upon you. So Lord,
Lord, may that be the center aspect of our lives. That we might glorify you. Father, if there's any here today, Lord, who, who does not have a saving relationship with you, Lord, they're missing out on the opportunity not only to glorify you, but to be glorified by you. And I'd ask that you would speak to that heart. Maybe there's someone here who, Lord, has fallen a little bit behind, has fallen off to the side, and is looking for uh, maybe a prayer of restoration. And Lord, that we'd ask that you would touch that heart as well. Maybe someone even looking for a church home, a place where they can gather with like-minded saints that they might glorify God in unison with other brothers and sisters. Lord, in any way that you would speak to their hearts, I'd ask that you would make them tender, that they would hear you in their response.